Three Men in a Boat by Jerome K. Jerome. Adapted for radio by Tom Stoppard. With Alex Jennings, Nicholas Leprevo, Julian Wadham and Ron Cook. There were four of us. George. <sighs> William Samuel Harris. And myself. And Montmorency. <laughs> we were sitting in my room, smoking and talking about how bad we were. Bad from a medical point of view, I mean, of course. I remember at the time, my liver was out of order. With me, it's giddiness. Yes, it's giddiness with me, too. Sometimes I have such extraordinary fits of giddiness, I hardly know what I'm doing. I hardly know what I'm doing, too. I have such extraordinary fits of giddiness. Mm. With me, it's my liver that is out of order. How do you know, Jay? Well, I was reading a patent liver pill circular which sets out the various symptoms by which a man can tell when his liver is out of order. I have them all, including what it calls a general disinclination to work of any kind. Mm, I've got that, too. I've been a martyr to it as early as boyhood. I was born with it. But they had no idea it was my liver. I have medical science was in a far less advanced state than now. They used to give me a clump on the side of the head. <laughs> we sat there for half an hour describing to each other our maladies. I explained to George and William Harris how I felt when I got up in the morning. I have these spots before my eyes, you see, and as for my tongue... Well, it feels like... Uh, and Harris told us how he felt when he went to bed. Ringing in my ears, you know, a sort of buzzing. And George stood on the hearth rug and gave us a clever and powerful piece of acting, illustrative of how he felt in the night. Completely paralysed, breaking out in a cold sweat, and the room going round. George fancies he is ill, but there's never anything really the matter with him. Ready for your supper, gentlemen? Mm. Mm. Supper? I suppose I should try. Steak and onions. Oh. And a rhubarb pie. Oh. A cousin of mine, who is usually described in the charge sheet as a medical student, told me that something in the stomach often keeps disease in check. Thank you, Mrs. Poppets. We'll do our best. Mm. Right you are. Mm. I don't mind coming to the table to show willing. Oh, boiled potatoes, too. Well, get around. Sit down. No, not you, Montmorency. Was there any mustard? I must have been very weak at the time, because I know after the first half hour or so, I seem to take no interest whatever in my food. All done. That's the way. Thank you, Mrs. Poppet. Oh, um... Let me do the door. Now, who couldn't manage that last potato? <laughs> what we need is rest. Rest and a complete change. Yeah, leave the 19th century behind. Seek out some half-forgotten nook hidden away by the fairies. Some quaint and old world spot far from the madding crowd and half as old as time. I know the sort of place you mean. Everybody goes to bed at eight o'clock and you can't get a referee for love of money. No, no. If you want rest and change, you can't beat a sea trip. Oh, I object strongly to a sea trip. On Monday, you swagger about as if you're Captain Cook and eat four courses for lunch. On Tuesday, you manage a water biscuit and wish you hadn't come. On Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, you wish you were dead. On Saturday, you're able to sip a little beef tea and sit up on deck. On Sunday, you can stand up and take solid food. And on Monday, you begin to enjoy it, just as it's time to go ashore. Ah, oh, well, if you're prone to seasickness, of course... I'm never seasick, as you know. Because at the moment, I happen to be on land. It's a curious thing. On land, it's impossible to meet anyone who has ever been seasick. At sea, you come across boatloads of them. <laughs> I remember Harris having to be restrained from throwing himself overboard off South End Pier. <laughs> that was the pickles they served at lunch. They were the most disgraceful pickles. I wrote to the steamboat company about them. Anyway, I fail to see how constant motion combined with an unvarying outlook can be described as rest and change. Why don't we go up the river? Up 
to the river. Fresh air. The changing scene will occupy our minds, including what there is of Harris's. Ah. Mm-hmm. And the exercise will give us an appetite and make us sleep well. Well, if you slept any more than you do, you might just as well be dead and save the board and lodging. However... I agree. It is a very sensible idea. Just goes to show that one should never write off a man who has never had a sensible idea before. He probably just needed a little encouragement. I propose... Second. I... Any against? I declare the motion carried by a majority of three to one. Move to adjourn. Second. I found a place just by the square where you can get a drop of Irish worth drinking. Ah, I am a bit thirsty. I think a little whiskey warm with a slice of lemon would help my complaint. Carried. And the assembly put on its hat, wagged its tail and went out. We arranged to start on the following Saturday from Kingston. We would spend a leisurely week going up as far as Oxford, sleeping under canvas, our boat snug in some quiet nook, lulled by the lapping moon-kissed water, the rustling leaves, and the sad cry of the moorhen under the great still stars. How about when it rains? That's you all over, Harris. There is no poetry about you. You were never a man who weeps. He knows not why. You always know why. And it's likely to be because you put too much Worcester sauce on your chop. Yes, we mustn't forget the Worcester sauce. And mustard, of course. Eggs and bacon. We'll need a frying pan. The Mm. secret is to make a good breakfast after our swim. Ah, yes. Refreshing early morning plunge into the limpid waters. Just the thing to give you an appetite. A swim before breakfast. Yes, we'll take three bathing towels so we don't keep each other waiting. I'll make a list. A pint of best. Thank you, Harris. The first list we made out had to be discarded. It was clear that the upper reaches of the Thames would not allow the passage of a boat large enough to take the things we had set down as indispensable. You know, we're on the wrong tack. Hmm? We mustn't think of the things we can do with, but only the things we can't do without. I call that downright wisdom, George. Throw the lumber overboard. Let your boat of life be light. Packed with only what you need. Simple pleasures. One or two friends worth the name. Someone to love and someone to love you. A cat. A dog. A pipe or two. Can't somebody Se- stop him? Huh? We won't take the tent. We'll have a boat with a cover. It's ever so much simpler. Yeah, when it rains, we'll spend the night in a pub. And by Friday, we had got together the bare necessities. There seems to be quite a lot of them. I'll pack. If I say so myself, packing is one thing I rather pride myself on. Like all arts, it requires an ordered mind rising to moments of inspiration. Now, Harris... Yep. um, You pass me the list, and George, Mm. you hand me the things as I call for them, while (sighs) Harris... Oh. Well, if you want to take that attitude, make yourselves comfortable, put your feet up, light your pipe... There are people who make such a fuss of packing a few things. We'd like you to show us. We'll study you carefully. It seemed a longer job than I thought it was going to be. It really is a pleasure to watch him. It's the methodical way he goes about things. Yes, it makes one feel that life is not, after all, an idle dream, but a stern duty, a noble task. (sighs) But at last, it was done. Aren't you going to put the boots in? Oh, why couldn't you say so before, you chucklehead? There. Is the soap in? I don't give a hang if the soap is in or not. Uh, have you seen my tobacco pouch anywhere? You packed it. Oh, place it. Yes. Well, uh, as we have to be off within 12 hours, I think uh, George and I had been uh, uh, hampers. Like all arts, it just needs an audit mind and the odd flash of genius. If you would pass me the things, George. Yes. yes. Tomatoes. Butter. 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 Pies. Pies. Right. Salt. Right. That's the way. No, 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 no. Hang on. Hang on. The tomatoes shouldn't be at the bottom. Hold on to the butter for a minute. I'll put it inside the kettle, should I? Get out the way, moderator. <laughs> Now, lemons at the bottom. No, no, plates at the bottom. Now look what you're going to do. You're standing on a pie. Give it here, Momoretti. Jake, how do you get this dog out of control? Now, the butter, George. Uh, I put it on the chair, except for the bit in the kettle. Pass me a spoon, I'll get it out again. Don't sit there, Harris. Ah! Who put that there? Steady on, Harris. We'll put the melon on top. 
No, not on top of the grapes. When George is hanged, Harris will be the worst packer in the world. But against all the odds, by ten o'clock next morning, Harris and I, and the Gladstone, and the small handbag, and the two hampers, and the big roll of rugs, and some overcoats and Macintoshes, and a melon by itself in a bag, and a Japanese umbrella, and a frying pan which wouldn't go in anywhere, and Montmorency were all on our way to the Kingston train. George, who goes to sleep at a bank from ten till four every day except Saturday, when they wake him up and put him outside at two. Was going to join us when we got up the river to Shepperton. The eleven o five for Kingston. Eleven o five for Kingston.、Mm. Number two, sir. Number two is the Windsor Loop. You want number one? Number one's the Rygate stopping. So I heard. Ah,、uh, excuse me.、Yeah. Um, the eleven o five for Kingston. Yes, indeed. I was just talking to a man who said he'd seen it on number three.、Ah. He was almost positive about that. Otherwise, there is a body of opinion which leans to the high level platform for the Kingston train.、Oh. Uh, though, in my view, that's the Southampton Express. Um, thank you. He don't know, sir. Do you think the engine driver would know? I'm sorry to trouble you, driver, but are you the 1105 for Kingston? I couldn't say for certain, sir. I might be, and then again, I might not. If I'm not, then I'm the 932 for Virginia Waters or the Guildford local. Um, here's a half crown for you. Would you please be the 1105 for Kingston? Well, some train's got to go to Kingston, I suppose, sir. So thank you kindly. The 1105 for Kingston is here, sir. I'm obliged. Uh, this is the excess of mail, apparently. It might be, and then again, it might not. All aboard! Up you go, Montmorency. And so we got to Kingston by the London and South Western Railway, and at twelve o'clock, with our luggage stowed, Harris at the sculls, and Montmorency unhappy and deeply suspicious in the prow, out we shot onto the waters which were to be our home. Caesar crossed the river here, and later Saxon kings were crowned at Kingston. King Edwin is one whose name you may recall. But Kingston's great period began when Hampton Court became the palace of the Tudors, and the royal barges passed up and down and strained at their moorings. Many of the old houses speak very plainly of those days when Kingston was a royal borough. And the long road to the palace was gay with nobles and courtiers and their ladies, clanking steel and prancing palfreys, rustling silks and velvets, fair faces attended by bright cloaked gallants crying, "Get me!" Devil! What are you doing down there? You thundering oaf! You're supposed to be steering. Oh, sorry, old chap. Um, push us off with the oar. Why don't you take your oars for a spell? I'm、um, not yet. I really don't mind you doing it. Have you ever been around Hampton Court? I, I went into the maze once to to show a country cousin the way. I studied it on the map. What happened? Well, we'll just go in so you can say you've been. But it's very simple. It's absurd to call it a maze. We'll just walk around for ten minutes. And then go and get some lunch. Thank you kindly. It seems Harris and his cousin met some people soon after they got inside, who said they'd been in there for three quarters of an hour. Want to get it over with? Just follow me if you like. I'm going in and coming out again. That's very kind of you, sir. Oh, everyone's welcome. You see, you just keep turning to the right. Oh, thank God he's come, sir. Oh, this way. We're just about giving up hope. Oh, go this way. That's it. This way. Turn right.、That's、and、it. bit by bit, they picked up all the people who were in the maze. Including a woman with a baby who had been in there all morning and insisted on taking Harris's arm for fear of losing him. Shush, shush, it's all right now, Albert. This kind gentleman has come to save us.、Yeah, we simply、yeah. keep turning to the right. You see, <laughs> this way, and、uh, this way. That's right. That's a right. Harris said he thought the map must have been got up as a practical joke because it wasn't a bit like the real thing. I suppose it's a very big maze. Oh yes, yes, it's one of the largest in Europe. Yes, it must be. 
because we've walked a good two miles already. Here, we passed that biscuit ten minutes ago. Oh, no. <laughs> Impossible. Yes, we did. It's Albert. I saw him throw it down. Oh, oh. Oh, well, um, according to the map... Oh, for oh, heaven's sake. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. All right. Oh, no. Listen, listen, listen. All right, all right. We'll go back to the entrance and start again from there. <laughs> now keep turning right. Left, left. This way, this way. Left, come on. You, this, left. Left, come here. Left. That's it, good. Left, keep on and left here. <laughs> Come on, keep up. Left. <laughs> left. <laughs> and left. And there we are. In the middle. Uh, just as I am. Um, uh... Harris thought at first of pretending that that was what he had been aiming at. But the crowd looked dangerous, and he decided to treat it as an accident. Come on, yes, yes, come on, left here. Come on, back we go, left. Follow me, keep together. Oh. Left, come on, keep up. Left, come on. That's it, left. And finally, left again, and here we are. Back in the middle. Uh, Albert and I will wait here. You go on. Madam, I advise you to follow me. No, it's all right. You can pick us up on your next time through. Silly old baggage. Here, who do you think you're talking to? Uh, well, all right. Anybody who wants to stay in the middle for the rest of the day is welcome. I'm going home now. <laughs> this way. Shush, do Once upon a time, long, long ago, there was a little boy who lived with his mother in the middle of a big, dark this forest. This way! Back! Oh, back! Look, here he is again, Albert. Yes, silly man. Yes. They didn't know how long they'd been there. And they'd forgotten where they'd come from. And while they waited to be found, they had to live on nuts this way. and berries. This way! <laughs> oh. oh, damn! After that, they simply couldn't get anywhere else. Back in the middle, Harris got his map out again, but the sight of it seemed to infuriate the mob, and they told him to... Go and curl your hair with it! And to... Away somewhere, and they all went crazy and tore up Harris's map. And the keeper had to rescue them by shouting directions from the top of the ladder. <clears throat> it's really a very good maze. <clears throat> we must try to get George into it on the way back. Good idea. <clears throat> Incidentally, yeah, I'm quite willing to let you scowl for a bit. I don't want to be selfish about it. As I dipped the skulls and Harris took hold of the rudder lines, I saw that his expression was becoming soulful and I feared the worst. Harris revels in tombs and graves and epitaphs and monumental inscriptions, while for me not even the sight of a bit of cracked brass let into a stone affords me what I call real happiness. It is one of the things that comes between us. Uh, uh, put in here a while, Jay. Here? Why? Uh, it's Hampton Church. I want to see Mrs. Thomas's who, tomb. Who is Mrs. Thomas? Oh, how do I know? Just a lady who has a funny tomb. I know it's supposed to be the proper thing to do. Every time you see a church, to rush off and enjoy the graves. <coughs> but I don't hold with it as a form of recreation. Anyway, we haven't got time. I've, I've looked forward to seeing Mrs. Thomas's tomb since the moment this trip was proposed. In fact... I wouldn't have come but for the thought of seeing Mrs. Thomas's tomb. This is morbid extravagance. Well, I'm sorry. What about the Scold's Bridal at Walton? Eh? I, I must see the Scold's Bridal. We have to get the boat up to Weybridge by tea time oh, to meet George. Oh, hang George. Leaving us to lug this top heavy barge up and down the river. Why couldn't he have got a day off? Bank be blow. What use is a bank? Take all your money, and when you write the cheque, it's all refer to drawer. Damn nerve. I shall withdraw my account. I'm going to get out and have a drink. There's some lemonade in the hamper. I said a drink. Not your Sunday school slops. Lemonade, raspberry syrup. They're poison. 
ruined body and soul and responsible for half a crime in England. Pull the line. What? The murder. Pull the line. Get. Oh, 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 what the devil? Oh, the other one. Oh. Can't we go ashore for a bit? Why not? Half the boat is already there. I say, though, this is a light, isn't it? Mm, no, uh, uh, Sorry if I was a bit touchy back then. Touchy? When? Wasn't I a bit touchy? About um, George and Mrs. Thomas. Were you? I hadn't noticed. Very kind of you to concern yourself, though. Well, not at all, old chap. Good egg. Well... We ought to be getting on, anyway. Oh. <clears throat> I'll take over the steering for a while, if you like. The backwater is quite strong here, but I think it can be sculled if you pull hard. No, 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 um, you take the sculls. I'd like to study you more. You seem to have a way which I haven't mastered. Really? Hmm. No, it's just a question of rhythm, really. Oh, The thing to remember yeah. is don't snatch at them. Steady, easy swing. One, two, two. Do you see? Yes, yes, I think so. Set us over rhythm and keep to it. One, two, one, one, two. God, I must say, it's always nice to see a thing done properly by an expert. Use the back of your legs. Shoulder square. Mm. Feet well planted. Mm. One. Two. One. Two. What's the matter? Hey, nothing. Can you see the lock yet? Uh, not yet, but you're doing splendidly. I thought the lock was just around the corner. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Just keep going. One. Two. <laughs> One. Two. The current here is stronger than it looks. Is it? Well, yeah, I dare say. Can you see the lock? Uh, not yet. Uh, you know, that bit of bank looks just like... <laughs> oh, you <laughs> swine, Harris. Oh, God, uh, one, two, one, two. Don't stop, we'll go uh, backwards. There is a lot to be said for rowing on the spot. It exercises the rower and entertains the steersman. But we got out the tow line and pulled ourselves to Walton. Walton is quite a large place for a riverside town, but only the tiniest corner comes down to the water. Windsor and Abingdon are the only towns between London and Oxford that you can really see anything of from the river. All the others hide round corners and merely peep at the river down one street. My thanks to them for being so considerate and leaving the river banks to woods and fields and waterworks. Caesar, of course, had a little place at Walton, an entrenchment or a camp or something of that sort. He was a great up-river man, was Caesar. Of course, that was before the railway. And we were counting on George to be up-river by now. The first thing we saw as we came in view of Shepperton Lock was George's blazer on one of the lock gates. And closer inspection showed that George was inside it. Hello. What's he carrying? Hello. What's that? A frying pan? No. They're all the rage up the river this season. Everyone's got one. It's a banjo. Oh. I never knew you played the banjo. Not exactly, but it's very easy, they tell me. And I've got the instruction book. Well, a banjo will go very well with your blazer. Do you like it? Hmm? Well, as an object to hang over a fruit bed to frighten birds away, I should respect it. Considered as an article of dress for any human being, except a Margate minstrel, it makes me ill. I have always found envy distasteful. <laughs> I noticed you and Jay were envious as soon as you saw it. Oh, I can easily dispose of such an idea. Your blazer would not suit me at all. 
I always like a little red in my things. Red and black. Mm. You know my hair is a sort of yes. golden brown. Rather a pretty shade, I've been told. And a dark red sets it off beautifully. I always stick to browns and yellows. My eyes have a rather unusual hazel glint. It's mm. mysterious. Well, it has been remarked. And I found that brown and yellow picks it up. Yes. You don't think your complexion is too dark oh. for yellows? Yellows don't suit you, you know. There can be no question about that. You ought to take to blues with white and cream <laughs> touched in. You'd really not look half bad in blues and creams if you kept your hat on. George, on the other hand... Why is George looking like a martyred goose and trying to hide his feet? Must be some girl. Uh, uh, no, it's... Everybody in the lock seemed to have been suddenly struck wooden. They were all standing and sitting about in the most quaint attitudes I have ever seen off a Japanese fan. All the girls were smiling sweetly, and all the fellows were frowning and looking stern and noble. And then, at last, the truth flashed across me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we don't want everyone looking at the camera. A natural pose, if you please. Very well, I leant with careless grace upon the hitcher, in an attitude suggestive of agility and strength, and threw an air of tender wistfulness into my expression, mingled with a touch of cynicism, which I am told seems... Boy! Look at your nose! George, something on your nose, I think. In the skiff! Get your nose up! Uh, Harris, the lockkeeper's talking to you. Watch your nose, you three with a dog! Steady now, ladies and gentlemen! Where's the boat tilting? Oh, you idiot, Jay, look out! You've got a nose stuck under the lock gate! Shove her back! Shove her back! Oh! Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, 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 We did not come out well in the photograph, and there was a certain amount of unpleasantness on the part of the photographer, who thought we should take a dozen copies each, since nobody else would order any. But with an extra pair of hands at the oars, we were able to put the incident behind us, and as twilight came, we found a very pleasant nook under a tree, a little below Magna Carta Island. And now you see the advantage of not having to pitch a tent. You get out the canvas cover, Jay, and I'll mm. show Harris how to fit the iron hoops into these sockets. Ow! Look out, old man! Oh. Don't let your end swing about like that. Wait, this one doesn't go there. No, pass me the... Ow! Watch what you're doing. Got it, got it! And with hardly any difficulty, prepared the boat for the night and had a light supper of veal pie with ham, chicken, tomatoes, hard-boiled eggs, pickles, apple turnover, biscuits and cheese and celery, and bottles of beer, and Montmorency abstaining from everything except the veal, ham, cheese, chicken, hard-boiled eggs and biscuits. <sighs> And now, let's see. Page one, holding your banjo. Mm. Page two. Ah, oh, well, I can skip that. Slowly, the golden memory of the dead sun faded. Silent, like sorrowing children, the birds ceased their song and only the plaintive cry and harsh croak of the moorhen and the corncrake stirred the awed hush around the couch of waters where the dying day breathed out her last. Night, upon her sombre throne, folded her black wings about the darkening world, and from her phantom place, lit by pale stars, reigned in stillness. Lovely black eyes. Two, two, two. Right, here we go. Two, two lovely black eyes. When night falls upriver, it draws a curtain over the sentries. We are as far back as imagination wants to take us. The gentle sound of the river against our little boat, 
the skittering of the moorhens in the reeds, the smell of grass heavy under dew, the moon among the clouds and in the shine of the water. These things have changed no more than the name of Runnymede since the day nearly 700 years ago when that name rang out in history like a great bell that is heard to this day. Such were my thoughts as I fell asleep. I came awake to the lightly carried sound of harness and hoofbeats and the murmur of a great crowd making its way across the open country. King John had slept at Duncroft Hall and all the day before the little town of Staines has echoed to the clang of armed men and the clatter of horses on its rough stones and the shouts of captains and oaths and jests of bearded bowmen billmen, pikemen, and strange-speaking foreign spearmen. The great pavilion brought there yester eve is being raised, and carpenters are busy nailing tiers of seats, while prentices from London town are there with many-coloured stuffs and silks and cloth of gold and silver. And up the slope of Cooper's Hill, just opposite, are gathered the wandering rustics and curious townsfolk. Each one as a different version of the great event that they have come to see. And some say that much good to all the people will come from this day's work. Then far down the road in the morning sun, a cloud of dust has arisen, and the pattering of many hooves grows louder. The barge is waiting. King John dismounts and takes his seat in the barge, and the barons follow in with each mailed hand upon the sword hilt. Slowly, the heavy, bright-decked barge leaves the shore and works ponderously against the current till it grates against the bank of the little island that from this day will bear the name of Magna Carta Island. And King John has stepped upon the shore and we wait in breathless silence till a great shout cleaves the air and the great cornerstone in England's Temple of Liberty has, now we know, been firmly laid. Well, what's the matter? Where am I? Run me. I'll be down in a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll have my black place up. Wake up, Harris. It's a beautiful morning. Get <laughs> off. <laughs> up you get, George. Let me know when breakfast's ready. Hmm? What about our swim? Oh, oh, no, I... You've been oh, looking yeah. forward to it. We bought three towers so as not to keep each other waiting. Come on, George! All uh, right, wait oh. a minute. But finally, we all three were ready to meet our fate and stare down at it for several minutes. I don't like the look of it. The best way is to jump straight in, I'm told. Yes, I think uh, perhaps a good place would be from that overhanging branch. Well, <clears throat> who's going to be in first? I am. Into my socks. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I ought to, with my throat. Mm, catch tomorrow. Hold the boat steady. Harris, I'm coming aboard. Right. I'll just uh, dip a toe uh, in to test the water. Mm. Hey! Hello. I think that'll do for now. Ah! 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 Hello. Ah! Oh, Jay is in. Oh! 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 Is it all right? Oh, lovely. You are duffers not to come in. Here I come. Give me a hand up. Oh. Oh. I wouldn't have missed it for worlds. Anyone's a little determination. Good for you, Jane. Oh, where's my towel? Oh, no. no need to chuck everything around. Oh, damn it. My shirt's in. <laughs> His shirt's in. <laughs> Well, I don't see what's so funny about it. <laughs> oh, shut up! <laughs> Got it. <laughs> <laughs> He's dropped it in again. Oh, I say, so I am. <laughs> Aren't you going to get your shirt out? <laughs> it is my shirt. It's yours. <laughs> what? You silly cuckoo. Why can't you be more careful what you're doing? You're not fit to be in a boat. Give me the hitching pole. 
<laughs> you did that on purpose. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. George is very dense at seeing a joke sometimes. He was still arguing the point when Harris and I made him row us up through Old Windsor, where, you will remember, Edward the Confessor had a palace, and Earl Godwin showed that he was guilty of encompassing the death of the king's brother. Earl Godwin broke a piece of bread and said, If I am guilty, may this bread choke me. And he put it in his mouth, and it choked him, and he died. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Let me eat my sandwich. Yes, you did, and I hope it chokes you. If this method of determining guilt were reliable, it would be a great improvement on other systems. But I dare say it would fail to shut some people up. And George didn't shut up till Maidenhead. Maidenhead is a snobbish place. The haunt of the river swell and his overdressed companion. Not a patch on Bath, you know. Rather common, really. It is a town of showy hotels, patronised chiefly by dukes and ballet girls. I have a little place here which might amuse you. The London Journal Duke always has his little place at Maidenhead, and the heroine of the three-volume novel always dines there when she goes out on the spree with someone else's husband. It is the witch's kitchen from which go forth those demons of the river. Steam launches. But all that is left behind at Bolter's. Between Bolter's and Cookham Locks is perhaps the sweetest stretch of all the river. Cliveden Woods still wore their dainty dress of spring and rose up from the water's edge in one long harmony of blended shades of fairy green. It always makes me feel, I don't know, it makes me feel like a cup of tea. That's it. The dainty dress of spring always does it to me. Let's get above Cookham and then have tea. Just a minute. Uh, what day is it? Uh, Sunday. I thought it was. We'll pull in about five-ish. I don't see why one should break one's habit just because we're on the river. Even song, Harris. Meat tea. We can have the cold beef and the tin of pineapple. Tinned pineapple? I'm exceedingly fond of tinned pineapple. Well, put your back into it, then. It's your turn, Harris. All right, though. I'll, I'll, I'll tow for a bit. Uh, pull into the back and let's get the line out, Jay. No, let me do it. I took great care in coiling it, and just for once, let's not have it knit itself into a tea cosy. There's something strange and unaccountable about a tow line. Now, hold that end, Harris, while I unravel it. Look at it scientifically. No, 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 don't pull on it. No, no, wait, wait. Turn it up the other way and pass your end. No, Under first it. twist it this way. Are you trying to weave a hammock? Oh, you see, it's happened again. <laughs> You didn't wind it up properly. It was all right when I gave it to you. Don't throw it away. I'm throwing it ashore. We have to start again. And it was well past tea time before we got it straightened out and towed our boat to Cookham, where we filled our water can from the village pump and tricked our kettle into boiling. I don't want any tea. Do you, George? No. I prefer lemonade. What about you, Jay? Somehow I've gone off the idea of tea. I don't care for myself if the kettle never boils at all. Ah. 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 Who's ah. some cold ah. beef? Well said, Alice. I think I can manage a slice or three. We forgot the mustard. What? No mustard? Oh, no. Cold beef without mustard. You hardly ever have mustard. Well, that is why it is such a blow. You have mustard habitually and thoughtlessly. You hardly know when you're having it. But when I want mustard, I want mustard. This is what comes of filling a boat without lemonade and bastards and useless cut. I knew it was a mistake to come. No, mustard. I don't know why I've ever had such a blow. I'll never get over it as long as I live. At least there's still the tin of pineapple. The tin of pineapple? Right. Pineapple. Oh, first rate. It does nothing quite like <laughs> the pineapple. Put fresh pineapple in the shade. It's the juice. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's more a syrup, really. It's not exactly sweet, uh, and it's not exactly bitter. It's In a way, it's not exactly crunchy and yet firm and clean tasting. Where's the opener? Well, I'm almost sure we brought one. We must have. It's just a question of finding it. it uh, we'll, we'll start with a hamper. We turned out everything in the hamper. We turned out the bags, 
We pulled up the boards at the bottom of the boat. We took everything out onto the bank and shook it. I'll use my pocket knife. Harris tried to open the tin with a pocket knife and broke the knife and cut himself. The scissors might do it. George tried a pair of scissors and the scissors flew up and nearly put his eye out. While they were dressing their wounds, I tried to make a hole in the thing with the spiky end of the hitcher. Take a run at it, Jay. Watch out. That's the way. <laughs> and the hitcher slipped and threw me into two feet of water. Damn it. And the tin itself rolled over and gently broke a teacup. Then we all got mad. Right, that's it. Harris got a big stone and I got the mast. We beat the tin out flat. We beat it back square. We battered it into every form known to geometry, but we couldn't make a hole in it. Then George went at it and knocked it into a shape so strange, so weird, so unearthly, that he got frightened and threw away the mast. Then we all sat round it on the grass and looked at it. The tin has one great dent that looked like a mocking grin, and it drove Harris furious. He rushed at the thing and flung it far into the middle of the river. And we got into our boat and rowed away from that spot and never paused till we reached Marlow, where we put up at the Crown and revittled the boat for the next three days. Good morning, gentlemen, and what will it be? A pound and a half of best bacon, thinly sliced, small tin of mustard, and... No pineapple. Good morning. Hello, can I serve you, gentlemen? Uh, we'll have um, three pounds of crosses, uh, a dozen of those oranges, and... A large loaf. Uh, half a dozen bath buns, a cherry cake. Uh, and crumpets. A tea cakes, and... Uh... Yes, sir, I will send them off at once. The boy will be down at the boats before you are, sir. You have my word. Uh, no... We do not propose to change the practice of an entire morning merely on your word. We will wait here and take the boy with us. Well said, Jay. Our progress to the jetty at Marlow I regard as one of our greatest successes. It was dignified and impressive, without being ostentatious. At the head of the procession was Montmorency carrying a stick. Then came two disreputable-looking curs, friends of Montmorency's, George, carrying coats and rugs and smoking a short pipe, Harris, trying to walk with easy grace while carrying a bulged-out Gladstone bag in one hand and a bottle of lime juice in the other, greengrocer's boy and baker's boy with baskets, boots from the hotel carrying hamper, confectioner's boy with basket, grocer's boy with basket, long-haired dog, cheesemonger's boy with basket, old man carrying a bag, bosom companion of old man with his hands in his pocket smoking a short clay, fruiterer's boy with basket, myself, carrying three hats and a pair of boots and trying to look as if I didn't know it. Six small boys and four stray dogs. Let me see, sir. Was yours the steam launch or the houseboat? Steam launch, indeed. <laughs> I do hate steam launches. Why, well, I suppose every rowing man does. I never see a steam launch without I should like to lure it to a lonely part of the river and strangle it. They aren't real river people, you know. Yeah. Not like us. Steam launch coming up astern. Right. We haven't seen it. Pull over near the middle, George. Uh, everyone get comfortable. Jay, why don't you distract us with one of those historical footnotes you used to pad out your articles? That's Bisham Abbey coming up. Oh, good. Oh. Tell us about Bisham Abbey, Jay. Well, since you ask, Warwick the Kingmaker lies buried at Bisham Abbey. Warwick the Kingmaker? Just stands here there. Yes, under the dining room floor. Oh, how unusual. No, I mean, before it was a dining room. And Henry VIII held court at Bisham Abbey. He gave the place to his wife. Wives, surely. No, it was Anne of Cleves at the time. She didn't like it. Changed it for some other place. Can you hear something? I keep thinking I can hear something. What sort of something, George? Yeah, no. Sort of hooting? No, I can't hear anything. Can you hear it, Harris? Well, I thought I heard something for a moment. Now you mention it, but tell us more. Well, the poet Shelley knew Bishop well, of course. It was while floating in his little boat under the Bishop Beaches that Shelley wrote the river. Ah, yes, you remember the poet's touching dedication to his wife. How does it go, Jay? So my summer's task is ended, Mary, and I return to thee, my own heart. Hello, what's that? Hello, 
was that? Uh, no, 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 you could misremember it. Uh, look, it's a lovely big boat. Why, George, bless me, it isn't the steam launch trying to get by. So it is. I thought I had something. Thank you. Any chance of the two? By Hurley Weir, a little higher up, I have often thought that I could stay a month without having sufficient time to drink in all the beauty of the scene. The village of Hurley, five minutes' walk from the loch, is as old a little spot as there is on the river. Just above the weir is Danes Field, where invading Danes once encamped during their march to Gloucestershire. And a little further up still is what is left of Mednam Abbey, whose notorious and bogus monks were known as the Hellfire Club, and whose motto, do as you please, still stands over the ruined doorway. Everybody knows about the Hellfire Club, but not of the Cistercian Monastery, which stood on this same spot in the 13th century. Those monks wore rough tunics, ate no fish, meat or eggs, rose at midnight for mass, and passed the day in total silence. A mode of life which might, if not overdone, be a benefit to some of us. Especially Harris, who not only eats fish, meat and eggs at every opportunity, but often talks at the same time. Why isn't the kettle on, George? We forgot to fill the water can. Go and ask at the lock keeper's cottage. Take the kettle. Good afternoon. <laughs> we're, um, <laughs> we're more just below your lock. Uh, could you spare us a little water? Certainly. Take as much as you want and leave the rest. Thank you so much. Where, where do you keep it? It's always in the same place, just behind you. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't see it. Well, has it gone, then? No. It's still there. Oh, but... We can't drink the river, you know. It's dangerous. I'm very sorry to hear that, because I've been drinking it for 15 years. Oh. Really? Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right if you boil the water. Are you sure? Oh, yes, yes. Mm. The germs are killed by the boiling. A little crawly thing is called, um, uh, bacillus. Bacillus? <laughs> yes, that's it, yes. They can't stand a boy. Drives them wild. A man said he'd drunk it for 15 years. How did oh. he look? Not well. But perhaps he didn't boil it. Well. Mmm. Well, it tastes all right. Uh, well, mm. I need this. Mm. What's that? What's what? What's that in the river coming downstream? Uh, oh. Oh, it's a dog, isn't it? A dead dog. A dead dog in the river? Um... I don't think I want any tea. Oh, what a good thing you saw it. I was about to drink mine. But I say, I've, I've had half my cup. Oh, I wouldn't worry about it too much, Jay. Yes, you, you'll be all right. Then why haven't you drunk yours? Do you think I'll get tired for it? Look, you'll know in a week or two. Look up the symptoms when you get back. Oh, I don't do that. It would be fatal. I remember going to the British Museum one day to read up the treatment for hay fever. Not now, old And in an unthinking moment, I idly turned the leaves of the book. And you began to study diseases generally? Mm, I did. I turned to some devastating scourge or other, and before I had glanced halfway down the list of premonitory symptoms... You found you got it. It was borne in upon me that I had fairly got it. In despair, I turned over the pages, came upon cholera, read the symptoms, and discovered I had cholera too. Must have had it for months without knowing it. And the same went for St. Vitus' dance. Beginning to get interested in my case, I decided to go at it systematically. I started at ague, which I was relieved to find I had only in a modified form and might live for years. And diphtheria I seemed to have been born with. By the time I had plodded through to zymosis, which I had evidently had since boyhood, the only malady I could conclude I had not got was housemaid's knee. I managed to make my way from the British Museum to my doctor's, well, old son, what's the matter with you? I do not want to take up your time by telling you what is the matter with me. Life is brief, so I will tell you what is not the matter with me. Mm. I have not got housemaid's knee. 
Everything else, however, I have. And what makes you think so? Well... Next! Oh, thank you. I have a doctor's prescription. I don't keep it. You are a chemist. I am a chemist. If I were a cooperative stores and family hotel combined, I might be able to oblige you. Being only a chemist puts me at a disadvantage. Why? What does it say? One, one pound beef steak, steak with one pint beer, beer every six hours. One ten-mile walk every morning. One bed eleven sharp every night. And don't stuff your head with things you don't understand. Have I told you before? <laughs> Hello, who is this? Do you gents know you're trespassing? What does he say? He wants to know if we know we're trespassing. I'm not sure that I've given the matter sufficient consideration. We have not given the matter sufficient consideration, but if you give us your assurance that we are trespassing, we would without hesitation believe you. Well, I tell you, you are trespassing. He says we are. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm supposed to turn you off. What does he say? He says it's his duty to turn us off. Well, if it's his duty, then he ought to do it. Uh, does he say how he intends to go about it? Uh, no, he's taciturn on the subject. Well, I shall tell the master and come back and chuck you in the river. <laughs> 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 He must make quite an income, blackmailing weak-minded noodles. That reminds me, we can take a backwater to Wargrave, it'll save us half a mile of river, and I'll enjoy navigating between all those signs saying, keep out, private. I know where you mean, I, I thought it belonged to the house, sir. Because that's what they want you to think. The sight of those notice boards does something terrible to me. Oh, it does to me, too. I feel I want to tear each one down and hammer it over the head of the man who put it up until I've killed him, and then I would bury him and put the board up over the grave as a tombstone. Yes, I do, too. Except that I want to slaughter his whole family, and his friends, and relatives, and burn down his house. Well, that's going a bit far. No, it isn't. Something jolly well right. And I go and sing comic songs on a ruin. Oh, oh no, no, no. Not one of your comic songs. <laughs> what do you mean? It will It will It will You have never heard Harris sing a comic song, or you would understand how shocked we were by the vindictiveness of Harris's proposed retribution. When Harris is at a party and his hostess asks him, Would you like to sing, Mr. Harris? Oh, I, do. Yes, do. <laughs> Harris replies, Well, uh, I can only sing a comic song, you know. <laughs> but his tone implies that his singing of that, however, is a thing that you ought to hear once. And then die. Oh, that is nice. Now, silence, please, everybody. Mr. Harris is going to sing a comic song. <laughs> and everyone murmurs how jolly, and they hurry in from the conservatory and the stairs and crowd into the drawing room and sit round, smirking in anticipation. I'm afraid it's a, a very old thing, you know. I expect you all know it, you know. Uh, but it's the only thing I know. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's the judge's song out of Pinafore. Oh, well, you know. Uh, no, no, I don't mean Pinafore. I mean, um, you know, the, I mean the, the other, the other one, you know. Um, well, anyway, you must all join in the chorus. <laughs> Murmurs of delight and anxiety to join in the chorus. Brilliant performance of prelude to the judge's song in trial by jury. Moment arrives. Harris takes no oh. notice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Nervous pianist starts again. And Harris... When I was a lad, I served a term as an apprentice boy that to turn his firm. I cleaned the windows and I swept the floor and I polished up the handle on the big front door. Dashes off the first two lines of the first Lord song out of uh, Pinafore. It's all right, you're doing very well indeed. Come on. Well, I'm afraid there's a mistake somewhere. What are you singing? Why, the, the judge's song out of trial by jury, don't you know? <laughs> well, you're not, you chucklehead. You're singing the Admiral's song from Pinafore. <laughs> don't you tell me what I'm singing. Long argument between Harris and Harris's friend as to what Harris is really singing. In the end, Harris, with an evident sense of injustice rankling inside him, requests pianist to begin again. <laughs> 
Paris seizing what he considers to be a favorable opening in the music. When I, good friends, was called to the bar, I an appetite fresh and hearty, but I was as many young barristers are an impecunious party. <laughs> General roar of laughter taken by Harris as a compliment. Pianist, thinking of wife and children, retires and is replaced by one with stronger nervous oh. system. Now then, old man, you start off and I'll follow. Mm -hmm. Oh, my bite you. I, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, of course, I, I, I've been mixing up the two songs. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was George. Who oh, confused me, you know? Uh, now dear. <laughs> when I was a lad, I served a term as an office boy. <laughs> Sorry, it's, uh, it's, it's too low, old man. Right. Right, well, we'll, we'll have to start it over again. Right. <laughs> Great surprise on the part of the audience. Nervous old lady near the front starts to cry, has to be let out. Oh, never mind. When I was a lad, I served a term as an office boy to an attorney's firm. I swept the windows and I swept the door and I, and I, I'm sorry, no, I, I cleaned the windows and I went from the door. And I polished up the floor and I, 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 it's a funny thing, I can't think of that line. Uh, uh, and I, and I, I think all... No, I'll tell you, no. Oh, well, we'll, we'll get on to the chorus of chants. And I diddle, 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 Excuse me. Mm? Where do you think you're going? Um, uh, we think we're going to Wargrave to view the famous memorial to Sarah Hill, who bequeathed one pound annually to be divided at Easter between the boys and the girls who had never been known to swear, tell untruths, or be undutiful to their parents. Was it ever one, Harris? I don't think so. Here, can you read what that notice says? Uh, certainly, anything to oblige. Um, private, uh, keep out. And that one says no boating. I must say, these notices are disgracefully inaccurate. Untruthful to a fault. And don't come <clears throat> back! <laughs> oh, this is such a pretty stretch. It's good to know that it belongs to anyone who cares to go out in a boat on the dear old Thames. And above Wargrave... We'll just be able to see Ship Lake Church. Do you know who was married there? Julius Caesar. Queen Elizabeth. And Lord Tennyson. Ship Lake is a pretty little place. I had a drink there once. Let's push on to Sonning. Sonning? Now that's the most fairly like little nook on the whole river. Yes, I know a very good pub in Sonning. You know a very good pub everywhere. If you got to be <laughs> Prime Minister and died, they'd put up signs over public houses up and down the Thames and most of London. Harris had a glass of bitter in this house. <laughs> Harris had two of scotch soap here in the summer of 88. Harris was chucked from here in December 1886. No, there'd be too many. The famous pubs would be the ones Harris never had a drink in. <laughs> Only house in South London missed by Harris. People would flock to see what could have been the matter with it. Well, the bull at Sonning. Ah, now the bull at Sonning is a veritable picture of an old country inn with low quaint rooms and lattice windows, and it obviously merits a serious visit. There's no need to go further up river today. We're in no hurry. Good idea. We can tie up at Shiplake Island for the night, and that'll give us plenty of time to do a slap up supper. I could do one of my Irish stews. Hmm. <laughs> You and Harris make a fire. Oh. Have you ever done an Irish stew? Well, not exactly, but it's very easy. Yeah. Just put in anything you want. It's a grand way of using up all the odds and ends, you see. Wow. A bit of bacon, pork pie, eggs, tinned salmon, cabbage, peas. Oh, good boy. Clever boy. Look, Montmorency's brought something for the pot. Oh. oh. I'm not sure about water rats. What do you think, Harris? Oh, put it in. If you've never tried anything new, what will become a progress? Mm, I don't know. I've never heard of water rats in Irish stew. Oh, do as you please. Uh, Jay, um, mm. you do the fire and, and I'll light it. Mm. I'm just going to have three fingers of my medicine and soda, well, without the soda, to prepare my stomach. Oh. Mm. I, I don't think I've ever enjoyed a meal more. Mm. Not as Montmorency. Oh, it's really good. 
a bit rich. It's giving me a bit of a headache. Well, uh, who's for a stroll into Henley? It's only about four miles. Mm, what about you, Harris? Well, I'll just row you over to the bank and have a quiet evening. I might have a toddy, saddle my stomach. You won't uh, go to sleep, will you? Are you suggesting I might become intoxicated? No, 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 my dear chap. <laughs> Give me a shout when you're back and I'll row over and fetch you. Joy good, Harris. happen to remember which of the islands it was. No, I don't. How many are there? Only about four. Uh, It'll be all right if he's awake. Uh, Harris! 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 Oh. Perhaps he can't hear us with the rain. Uh. Oh. That's it. Well, I'm going to stay exactly like this until morning. Well, I don't know where we are. I don't know where Harris is. I'm going to die anyway, and well, I'm not going to move any more. Hang on. What was that? Montmorency! Here! Harris! Grab hold, Jay. Yeah. What's, what's the matter with him? Uh, he's asleep. Harris! Harris, what's happened to you? Swans! Swans? I'll row. <laughs> I'm moored by the nest. They kicked up an awful row about it. I had to fight them off eight of them all around me. How many? <laughs> Terrible battle. Fighting off 40 swans. How many? 18. Fought them off for three hours of the oar. Can you imagine? Thirty-two swans. You said eighteen just now. Oh, I said twelve. I think I can't count. Keep rowing, George. Right oh! I slept well that night, and should have slept better if it had not been for Harris. I have a vague recollection of having been woken up at least a dozen times during the night by Harris wandering about the boat looking for his clothes. Oh, what the thunder do you want your trousers for in the middle of the night? He seemed to have been worrying about his clothes all night. Ah, what should we have for breakfast? Something plain. Very, very, very plain. Oh. What was all that last night about swans? What swans? Well, never mind. It's my turn to steer. You two take the skulls. Mm -hmm. It's about time you and Jay did some work. <laughs> Fancy George talking about work. Half an hour of it would kill him. Have you ever seen him work, Jay? Certainly not on this trip. Nor me. I don't see how you'd know one way or the other. You're asleep half the time. What? Have you ever seen Harris fully awake, Jay, except at meal times? Honesty compels me to say no. In fact, Harris has done very little since we set off. Well, I've done more than you. Huh? You couldn't very well have done less. Oh, Jay thinks he's a passenger. Oh, so <laughs> that's your gratitude to me for having brought you and your wretched boat all the way up from Kingston and supervising everything and slaving away for you where it's no more than I expected. It was finally agreed that Harris and George would scull up past Reading and I would take the boat on from there. We were evidently becoming old river hands. You can always tell an old river hand by the way he likes to give others a chance. All this hard work by Jim Biffles and Jack and I last season pulled from Marlow to Goring in one afternoon. Never stopped once. Remember that, Jack? Against the wind? It was. As old river hands ourselves, we were alternately irritated and amused by the antics of the unsuitable types of person in charge of every craft on the water but ours. Oh, oh, Just look at them. Like a mad spider. Fancy hiring out a racing skull to a party of tyros like that. Oh, dear, look. I say, couldn't 
Someone help! I've made up his panting girl. I wonder what happened to the punt. <laughs> oh, one cannot help but deplore the way the river is abused by young pups and doddering old fools who have not the faintest conception of boatmanship. Absolutely without sensitivity to the moods and dignity of the river. Mm, well, the fault must lie partly with the boatmen who hire out quite unsuitable craft of enthusiastic amateurs. Not to mention spooning nincompoops who think the place is some kind of floating tea dance. Mm. Th th there are grounds, in my opinion, for barring girls from the river altogether and less properly dressed. A boating costume is very fetching on a pretty girl, though. But a boating costume, in an ideal world, is a costume which can be worn in a boat and not merely under a glass case. Girls. Like Christian martyrs every time a drop of water comes near them. Yeah. Well, they're awfully useful on picnics. No, they're not. Ask them to wash a plate is as though they've been asked to pick rags on a corporation tip. No, you have to be firm with them. Get them to tuck up their skirts. Look, she's quite pretty, isn't she? Well, oh, yes. Well. Oh, 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 what? What are you doing? God. Save us from London land! <laughs> so sorry. 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 Uh, so sorry. Sorry. One does not linger in the neighbourhood of Reading. The river is dirty and dismal here. At Reading Lock, one of those steam launches came in behind us. All right, all right. I think they own the river with their money and their trollops. Jay! What? Jay! Good morning! Fancy meeting you! Catherine's home! Thanks! Do you know my friend, George? Hello. And Harris! Oh, hello! A banjo! Oh, do show me! Oh, I, I, I don't play very well yet, but I, I can show you how to hold it. Um, give me your hand a moment, I'll just... I say, this makes a nice change. I've burnt myself to rowing. <laughs> Look out, you lot! What's going on? Some fools in a rowing boat taking up half the river. Confounded idiots! Are they deaf? Move over! Ship your oars! I say, we'll Where swap them! Serve them right. It's really most annoying the way these wretched little boats get in one's way. I'm going to write to the Times about it. And I'll put it in my article. Above Maple Durham to Streetly, the river is glorious. You pass Hardwick House, where Charles I played bowls. I expect it is known for other things as well. I noticed Harris looking longingly at Basildon Church, which you pass on the left bank. Our left, that is. You see that church? The mortal remains of Jethro Tull lie buried in that ground. Remember him? Not altogether. Oh, really? Oh, I'm surprised. He invented the seed drill. Did he? He's a very great man in the world of agricultural mechanization. It is not the world with which I am most familiar. Oh, George, yes. uh, the inventor of the seed drill lies there. Oh, good heavens. Now, Emily... You do the strumming, and if I put my arm around here, I can do the finger biz. Now, here's the thing. Gatehampton Railway Bridge. One of Brunel's three brick bridges over the Thames. George? Yes! Brick railway bridges. Uh, Jay doesn't want you to miss it. Thank you. You know, Emily, you have a natural gift. Really? My friend's launch cast us off just above the bridge. I think it's your turn at the skulls, Jay. Surely not. It's you or George. How do you make that out? George and I sculled up to Reading. Exactly. And it was agreed that I would take the boat three miles above Reading. And here we are ten miles above Reading. But you imbecile, we got a tow. What of it? It was never specified how I would contrive to get our boat above Reading. You do agree that we are above Reading. <laughs> right, George, chuck him in. You <laughs> take his legs. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hold on, <laughs> hold on. No, George. <laughs> uh, to save argument, I'll scull us up to Streetly. That's better. I'll show you around Streetly. What will it be? Uh, well rowed, Jay. Uh, yeah. Two pints of mild, please, oh. uh, in separate tankards. And a pint of mild, Harris. Yeah. That's better. Mm. Mm. That's more like it. Uh, Say again. Mm. I say, that's a wonderful fish up there over the oh, bar, isn't no. it? Oh, fell out of that trout, didn't he? Quite uncommonly fine. How much do you think it weighed? Eighteen pound and six ounces. Mm. Oh. 
Yes, it were <coughs> sixteen year ago, come third of next oh, month, that I landed him. Oh. I caught him just below the bridge with a minnow. Hmm? They told me he were in the river. I said I'd have him, so I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, good day, gentlemen. Good day. Good day. Good day, day all. Good day, Fred. <clears throat> Will you stay for one? No, just come to get my jug filled and I'll be off. And the same again over here, please, Arnold. Right, yeah, gentlemen. You're not from these parts. No, 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 we're on the river. We were just admiring that fish. He's a beauty, isn't he? Mm. It were nearly five years ago I caught that trout. What? Oh, it was you who caught it? Yes, sir, just below the lock. And the remarkable thing about it is that I caught him on a fly. 21 pound he weighed, and he was 21. half an hour in the catching, and I thought my horse hair would break every minute. Oh, <laughs> there you are, Fred. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well... Good day, gentlemen. Good day. And three points a mile, was it, gentlemen? Oh, well, first off, it's closed already. Oh, I'm on my duties, landlord. A letter for you. I'll leave it on the bar. All right, thank you. Good day. Uh, Excuse me, postman. Uh, Please, uh, forgive the liberty, but my friends and I were just wondering (coughs) if you'd tell us... How you caught that trout up there? Mm. Boy, who told you I caught that trout? Well, nobody told us, sir. We just felt instinctively that it was you that had caught it. Mm. Well, it's the most remarkable thing. Most remarkable. Because, as a matter of fact, you're quite right. Mm. That fish there broke my rod. And it took me an hour and a half to bring him in. And when I got him home, he turned the scales at 24 pounds... Ten ounces. Oh, 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 I was happy oh, man that yeah. day, right <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, Would you have one with us? Oh, why? Oh, 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 thank you, no, sir. I, I'm not a drinking man. Oh, uh, good day to you. There we are, gentlemen. Uh, you know those fellows who were just in here? Jim Bates, Joe Muggles, and old Billy Chamberlain, the postman. Uh, they tell a good tale. Each of them told us how they caught that trout up there. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yes, they oh. would. They would give it to me to put up in my parlour if they'd caught it, no doubt, eh? Eh? Of course. <laughs> oh, you mean... I don't take no credit for it, sir. Uh, oh, it's just a lad beginner's luck. But that fish saved me a cane in the right. <laughs> Schoolmaster said it was worth playing the whack from school with fish like that. <laughs> well, there we are, sir. <laughs> Don't hold it against them, sir. Oh, it's no. just they're a bit of fun with strangers. Uh-huh. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'm mm. short-handed today. Mm. Here you are, George. Uh, hold the stool steady. I, I want to have a closer don't, look. Don't, eh? don't take it off the wall, George. It's private property. It's only on a hook. <coughs> oh! 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 It's all in pieces. <coughs> I thought it was smashed <coughs> like that. Why, it's, it's plaster of Paris. We left Streetly early next morning and pulled up at Cullum and slept under canvas in the backwater there. Wallingford, six miles above Streetly, was a fortified town up to the time of the Parliamentary War when it suffered a long and bitter siege. It fell at last and the walls were raised. From Wallingford up to Dorchester, the country grows more hilly and picturesque. From Day's Lock, you can walk across the fields to Dorchester... Known to the ancient Britons as Car Doran, the city on the water. The water being the Tame, which joins old Father Thames a little below here. Abingdon also prides itself on being old, but it can't compare with Dorchester. It is a typical country town of the smaller order, quiet, eminently respectable, clean, and desperately dull. Must, must stop here and stretch our legs. Pub or church? Uh, or church? St. Helens. Whose memorial? Uh, Mr. Lee. Did he invent agricultural implements or make eccentric and useless bequests? Yeah, well, he, he was a, the mayor of, of Abingdon and had 197 children. Well, you and George can go while I buy provisions. I'll see you back on the boat. W. Lee. Died 1673. Had in his lifetime issue from his loins 200 lacking but three. There you are. What did he die of, does it say? No. Rest in peace. 
Must make quite a change for him. Well, that's that one. Now, in St. Nicholas's, I'm told there's an even older memorial to a couple called Blackwall who had a happily married life and died on the same day. Then we'll go and have a drink. Harris. Hmm? What is it? Nothing. Come on. Come on. Any sign of Jay? No. Oh, there he is. What's he doing in that pub? Where? Well, look, see his blazer? Oh, yes. What's he up to? I bet he's met up with some girl showing off. Well, he's making an awful ass of himself. <laughs> I say he is, isn't he? <laughs> Bravo, that man! <laughs> Encore! <laughs> you look like a monkey on a stick! Round she goes again! Are you coming or going? <laughs> oh, he got... <laughs> All hands to the pumps, this way to the boating tragedy. He's down. No, he's up. He's down. Right. Look at him, right. Mum Lorenzi. Right. Hello, you two. Who are you shouting at? Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh, dear. That's my fiancé. I'm so sorry. We, we, we thought he was a close friend of ours. It was the blazer. London manners, no, is it? No, not at all. Or rather, well, I suppose he is. Well, yes. that's for you. Ah. We, we would not have insulted him if we'd known he wasn't a close friend. Oxford students are warranted. You're too kind, madam. They are barely educated. I will take them to Oxford at once. Get on board, you idiots. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. The weather changed when we got to Oxford. We turned for home in bucketing rain. <laughs> well, it might have been a bit of rain. Ah, I like to see the river under all its different aspects. Can't expect sunshine all the time. Nature is beautiful, uh, even in her tears, eh, George? Uh, she's wet, Jay. Uh, where are we? Nearly at Sanford Lock. Oh. It's the deepest lock on the river. Oh, yes, yes. There's a memorial to two men who drowned there. Oh, without leaving the boat. Have some veal pie. It's a bit damp. So the veal pie It's a bit damp. Oh, well. Here you are, Mama Zip. You see... Even the dog knows when he's had enough. When I get back to London, I'm going to have some white bait and a cutlet and a, a bit of Stilton. Oh. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. I'll have, um... Uh, no, no, I'll have a sole with white sauce followed uh, by... I'll run. Uh, one thing we all agreed upon is that we would go through with the job. It's not a job, it's our holiday. And we agreed we would go through with it. No. I'll, I'll start again. First, smoked trout. Followed by mutton with caper sauce. Oh, shut up! I knew a man who came up river two years ago and slipped out in a damp boat on just such a night as this. And it gave him rheumatic fever. He died in agony ten days later. Yes, a, a friend of mine, who had been in the volunteers, slept on the canvas one wet night down at all the shot. Uh, and when he woke up in the morning, he was a cripple for life. Pull over. There's something in the water. Uh, oh. It, it looks like... Oh, my God. It was the dead body of a woman. It lay lightly on the water, and the face was sweet and calm. Of course, it was the old, old, vulgar tragedy. She had loved and been deceived, or deceived herself. She had wandered about the woods by the river's bank and finally stretched out her arms to the silent stream that had known her sorrow and her joy. And the old river had taken her into its gentle arms and had laid her weary head upon its bosom and had hushed away the pain. Thus had she sinned in all things, in living and in dying. God help her and all other sinners, if any more there be. Two lovely black eyes Oh, what a surprise uh, Only for telling a man he was wrong Two lovely black eyes 
lovely black eyes. The second day back was exactly as cheerful as the first. George, however, was philosophical. <laughs> you know, it's almost a pity we made up our minds to contract our certain deaths in this floating coffin. And Harris was optimistic. It's only two more days and we're young and strong. We, we may get over it, all right? I care not for the rain. I care not. Do you know, the rain. there's a train which leaves Pangborn um, um, soon after um, five, um, which will take us up to time um, comfortably to get um, atop um, and go um, on to the Alhambra. Um, well, Jay, uh, 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 this reminds me of a very funny story that happened to a friend of mine. Right, George, I'll get the bag. I'll, I'll do the hamper. No, 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 just, just a moment. Did you... So now I'll have them. We did. Preceded by a little French dinner somewhere. Just so. With perhaps a bottle or two of Burgundy. Undoubtedly. Mm. Why didn't you say so? Mm. Now, I'm packing. Right. George, yeah. you so that while we can leave. Yeah. Harris, right. you pass me the rest. Right. We deceived the boatman at Pangbourne. We left the boat and what it contained in his charge with instructions that it was to be ready for us at nine in the morning. Nine o'clock, sir. Right you are. If, uh, if anything unforeseen should happen, preventing our return, we will write to the uh, hotel with instructions. Here's half a crown for you. I understand, gentlemen. Uh, the station is that way. Oh, oh thanks. Here it comes. Ah, the rain's stopped. It might be a nice evening. Well, we had a pleasant trip. Mm. But I think we did well to chuck it when we did. And my hearty thanks for it to old Father Thames. Yes. It's not a bad old river. No. no it's not a bad old river. Paddington train! <laughs> Come on, Montmorency. <laughs> Three men in a boat, to say nothing of the dog, first appeared as a serial in the magazine Home Chimes in 1889. I intended there to be some humorous relief, but the book was to be called The Story of the Thames, with its scenery and history. I decided to write the humorous relief first, but it seemed to be all humorous relief. Uh, most of the serious stuff which I managed to get done was promptly slung out by the editor, who also objected to my title. Halfway through, I hit upon three men in a boat, because nothing else seemed right. I did not have to imagine or invent. Boating up and down the Thames had been my favourite sport ever since I could afford it. I just put down the things that happened. Harris was Carl Henschel. I know a very good pub at Sonning. I met him first outside a theatre, at the door to the pit. His father introduced photo etching into England. Carl worked the business up, and we thought he was going to end up as Lord Mayor. But the war brought him low. In fact, he was a Pole, but his trade rivals had got their chance and took it. George was George Wingrave. Why don't we go up the river? The changing scene will occupy our minds, including what there is of Harris's. Who subsequently became a bank manager. I met him when lodging in Newman Street, and afterwards we shared in Tavistock Place, handy for the British Museum reading room. I wrote the book at Chelsea Gardens, up 97 stairs. I was just back from my honeymoon and had the feeling that all the world's troubles were over. In Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog, by Jerome K. Jerome, adapted for radio by Tom Stoppard, Jay was played by Alex Jennings, Harris by Nicholas Le Prevot, George by Julian Wadham, and Montmorency by Ron Cook. Other parts were played by Julie Bond, David Antrobus, Peter Yap, Michael Tudor Barnes, 
Don McCorkindale, Christine Millwood, Annabel Mullion, and Joshua Taub. The pianist was Matthew Scott. Technical presentation was by Simon Moorcroft, and the production assistant was Joe Hill. Three Men in a Boat, to say nothing of the dog, was directed by Hilary Norrish. <laughs>